Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on the call this morning. We really do appreciate it. But before we get going, we're just going to do a nice little logistical sound check. So if you can hear me, please uh, enter in the message box the color of the toothbrush that you used this morning, hoping that you used one. Beautiful. That was so quick, and that makes me so happy. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Thank you guys for that. Um, and if you guys are having any uh, errors, things um, with the audio, just type them in the message box, and then I'll respond to you to kind of um, help fix that in any way that I can. Um, but with that in mind, I will get this started so we don't waste anyone's time. Um, welcome to part two of the OMS series that we started last month in September. Um, Carl will be heading up this presentation with um, with a PowerPoint and some demos here and there on the side as well. So again, if there are any logistical issues, just please type those in the message box and we will um, handle those accordingly. Um, along with that, if you guys have any questions about what Carl is presenting throughout it, again, type those in the message box and I will be moderating this on the back end um, so we can kind of get this, uh, keep this clear and answer any questions that there are. So. Without further ado, Carl, I will let you take the lead uh, and take it from here. Excellent. Thanks, Parker. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us once again here on our cloud infrastructure series. We, uh, I have a feeling, are going to go beyond part two with OMS because there's just so much to cover, uh, and that's a good thing, right? I'm going to share some of uh, some of my insights here from Ignite uh, 2016. I uh, was lucky enough to attend the conference uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, speak directly with a good number of customers and, and probably some of you as well. So we're going to spend time talking about Ignite. This kind of derails what I was originally going to do with part two of this session, which, uh, which is why you know, I mentioned I, I think we're going to have more than one uh, part here beyond one and, and two. Uh, going forward because there was so much announced and there are so many valuable services inside of the operations management suite that I think you all want more. And we're going to end our presentation today with, with a rundown of exactly what you would like to know. I'd love to capture that. And another thing I would love to do is get you some other speakers as well from the product teams, from engineering. And the reason being, not that uh, I you know, don't love coming on and, and talking with everyone, I absolutely do. This is one of the most fun things I get to do in my role. But uh, by this time, after the end of this session, uh, you've got to be pretty sick of me. So I think it would be great to, uh, to hear from, from some others in, in the product team, and we'll get uh, those sessions lined up. And we'll do it based on your interests after our discussion today. So we've got a bunch of things to cover. I'm going to move pretty quickly. I do have a few demos that I'd like to uh, do for you all today. Worst case scenario, if we don't get to those, I'll make sure and record a few things. We'll post those on Yammer, or we'll get to those demos during the, uh, the additional parts of, of our OMS series here. So here's what we're going to walk through today. Again, bunch of content, bunch of good things I think you'll all enjoy. If uh, you did attend Ignite, uh, I think there's still going to be some updates here that are that are worthwhile and, and maybe you uh, you didn't have a chance to hear about while you were there. Uh, so just bear with me. I, I think there's going to be good content for everybody. First of all, I threw up this slide uh, last go around during part one, and I wanted to highlight that one particular portion there, the demo environment. That's a question that I get often from my peers and the partners that I work with directly is, hey, I've got a lot of excitement being generated in my customer base around operations management suite. How can I effectively demo it outside of setting an OMS workspace up with my own uh, subscription? So our OMS product team has done a great job of building a demo environment for you. And I've highlighted that here. It's experience.mms.microsoft.com. You can go to that site, you can register, and you get access to a massive environment that we have set up and pre-populated 
to help you deliver some really good, really effective OMS demos. So I wanted to highlight that one resource in particular. Again, I know we reviewed those last time, but, uh, but worth another mention because that's such a common question. So Ignite, Ignite, Ignite was great. I, I, I loved it. Uh, I worked the OMS booth in, um, in the Microsoft uh, event uh, uh, staff uh, fashion and, and just had, uh, had a ton of fun talking to customers and partners. And one of the big things we announced at Ignite was yet another pricing model for OMS. So last month, we reviewed the OMS E1 and E2 suites. So what you see on the right is nothing new. That's, uh, that's what we discussed last go around. There are a couple of new things that I thought warranted mentioning. So let's start over on the left. And when you look at the individual service prices, we lowered the price per VM per month for Azure Site Recovery uh, Enterprise to Azure. So that means leveraging Azure as your DR site with Site Recovery has gone down to uh, less than 50% of what the cost was prior to Ignite. The list price or the pay-as-you-go price for Site Recovery was $54 per month per machine. It's now gone down to $25 per month per machine which is incredibly cost effective, incredibly, um, just a drastic reduction that, that makes that service even more valuable. And what we've also done is we've broken out the components across the four pillars in the, the OMS uh, suite so that customers have the option to purchase just what they want, just what applies to their use case at that time. Now, with all of this in play, any one of your customers can still leverage the individual OMS services with the pay-as-you-go pricing or with their EA pricing uh, under their Azure subscription. What the OMS suite pricing that you see in those two purple-headed tables there um, is, uh, is, is a, a discount over the, uh, the, the pay-as-you-go pricing that's, that's pretty pretty darn good, pretty darn attractive. And with the new bundles that we introduced, Insight and Analytics, Automation and Control, Security and Compliance and Protection and Recovery, it, it gives more choice. So discounts above and beyond pay-as-you-go pricing, but more choice in terms of, do I want the entire suite or do I just want an individual pillar within it? So I thought I would mention this again for folks who, uh, who haven't seen this yet, weren't able to attend Ignite, uh, additional flexible pricing options for OMS. Now, standing at the booth for uh, four plus days, there were some questions that I heard over and over and over again. And that means if I heard them directly from customers, I'm sure you all will as well. So I wanted to bring these up. I wanted to prep all of you because I think it gives you a great opportunity to go out to your customer base show value, show you're their trusted advisor, and provide them some good guidance along these five points that came up again and again and again on the floor of, uh, of the expo at Ignite. So uh, customers came up to me and um, noticed that there's a little overlap between System Center Operations Manager, OMS, and the newly announced Azure Monitor service. And they were looking for a little guidance on what to use where and when, why one versus the other, or is it even a matter of choosing one versus the other option, or, or are they complementary? So we had a lot of conversations around that first point. And the guidance that we were providing on the show floor to uh, two customers who came up and asked that question and there were literally hundreds uh, I mean, that I talked to alone, is all three of these are key management and monitoring solutions for Microsoft going forward. So OMS is not a replacement for System Center. Azure Monitor is not a replacement for OMS. These are three complementary solutions that have some very specific use cases. We can think of SCOM, is continuing to be the best product from Microsoft for monitoring and managing on-premise resources. 
That's where System Center will continue to shine. It's where we will continue to develop and add functionality uh, to System Center going forward. OMS is our cloud asset uh, solution. So not only does it leverage the horsepower of, of Azure for delivering uh, query results in, in log analytics, for example, in a, in a very, very rapid fashion without requiring a massive amount of computer storage on premise, but it's tailored towards public cloud assets. And we continue to add support for Azure and other public cloud um, uh, solutions as we go forward. And that's where the investments will be with OMS. Azure Monitor is a great real-time solution that allows you to monitor your machines uh, as they are at that moment and going back over a limited set of history. And I'm going to show you Azure Monitor in, uh, in our demos, but you know, the, the net net is Azure Monitor, real-time and near-term historical, OMS, long-term historical, public cloud uh, resources is where it really shines, and SCOM, the best on-premise solution, and that's where we'll continue to, uh, to develop SCOM. So number two, you can help your customers, and we had this conversation in uh, part one, in differentiating between backup and DR. Many of the customers who came up to me were thinking of traditional backup to Azure as providing the best DR solution for them. And what they misunderstood many times was how quickly you can recover an environment with site recovery with a DR solution versus a backup solution, which requires a restore before you can uh, begin running your applications and your business again. Uh, whereas a DR solution like site recovery is merely a failover to a warm environment. So it's very quick, it's minutes versus hours or days. So helping your customers to understand that is one of the best things you can do as a trusted advisor. And breaking down the costs, especially with the new pricing model around site recovery, is a great way to show them that they can afford this type of availability solution that in the past they haven't been able to. It's been out of reach because of the redundant compute network and storage environment that they would need uh, in either a hosting facility or a data center of their own. DR to the cloud is a much more uh, price friendly solution than what they've looked at in the past. Log analytics was the hot topic. People came out of sessions, really loved what they saw about log analytics and they wanted to know more. The log analytics uh, booth within our, our OMS workspace uh, had to increase their staffing to support all the folks that were coming up and wanted to know more. So if you haven't introduced your customers to log analytics, if you haven't delivered a demo, you're missing out on a great opportunity, I would take advantage of that. Use that demo environment, that OMS demo workspace that uh, I highlighted earlier. Get them excited and then go in and help them implement. It is something that they want, something they see the usefulness of, and boy, did they want to know more. That booth, I wish I had taken pictures because we had, at times, two rows of 10 customers deep who were watching these, uh, these sessions. Uh, just, just, a, just a hot commodity there. Update management, and we're going to talk about some of the, uh, the specific, up, uh, specific updates that, that were released at, um, at Ignite, but update management uh, under Azure Automation was uh, another hot topic. The Azure Automation folks, I think, were busier than they expected due to the, uh, the configuration management and the update management uh, announcements that they had. So learn about update management, talk to your customers, they'll want to hear it. And then the final one was security. The merging of Security Center into the, the OMS uh, portfolio, into the offering, uh, caused a lot of conversations. Customers were very interested in the um, uh, worldwide analysis that we provide for threats. Uh, we're very, very interested in the security assessments that OMS provides, how easy we can identify common security flaws, common misconfigurations, and point those out and speed time to resolution. Security is always top of mind for customers, and what OMS brings to the table was very attractive to them. So get in there, have those conversations, learn more. 
Where can you learn more? Here's a list of all of the sessions that we delivered at Ignite on OMS. Uh, these are all available now if you go to ignite.microsoft.com, look at the sessions, uh, and search for the session code. So BRK1017 will uh, bring up that security-related session for you where you can learn more, and you can also download the slides and, uh, and feel free to reuse those. Those are all customer-facing. So what announcements did we deliver? Well, we talked about uh, application dependency monitoring in our last session. I'm hoping I get to go in and show you a demo of that today. This is what we have brought to OMS from the Blue Stripe acquisition. It is currently in private preview. So aka.ms slash get ADM, ADM down at the bottom is where you can register for the private preview, help your customers register for the private preview. But depending on timing, uh, we are planning on releasing the public preview of ADM by the end of this month or early November. And it's in flight here based on feedback we continue to get from the uh, private preview. But um, our goal is by end of month to make this available to everyone as a, as a public preview service within uh, the, the Azure Management Portal and OMS workspaces. So. Watch for that. I'm going to show you a, a very simple demo I have in my environment, an awesome solution that your customers are going to love. Some of you may have tried our uh, network monitoring solution that we released briefly under uh, OMS. Um, uh, when was that? About nine months ago, I think. Uh, we, we removed that from uh, the solution due to some uh, performance issues. We weren't real happy with the way that uh, that, that solution was performing for us. So we are re-releasing the optimized new version of network performance monitoring. And there's a whole session on this, on what it delivers. I'd encourage you to go and review that Ignite session. Uh, great, great solution in public preview now within OMS workspaces, and a great way to do some uh, diagnostics and monitoring on uh, customer network environments. So great tool, revamped something that, uh, that I think everybody's really going to love. And opening up uh, OMS to supporting third-party solutions, aggregating data, and providing those fast query results and sophisticated analysis uh, is, is now something that we've released in public preview as well. So great way for you to, uh, again, add value to your customers and provide great services, values, valuable services to them by helping them incorporate third-party logs into uh, log analytics and, uh, and drive value and get, um, get some good info out of there that's going to benefit them in, uh, in the long run. Uh, now, before we move on to automation and control, there are a few things that we announced that didn't make the highlight slides here. Uh, MySQL monitoring in uh, the Insight and Analytics pillar is something that we introduced. We can now provide customers with a view of resource consumption from MySQL queries that they're running within their databases. Really, really useful um, thing there. We've added the ability to aggregate Azure Activity Logs from multiple subscriptions into a single workspace. So a great way to correlate activities that are happening for customers that have multiple subscriptions and get an all-up view of those. Uh, performance monitoring for Azure SQL is something that we added in, uh, in these uh, announcements at Ignite. And uh, VMware monitoring. We can now monitor performance of VMware hosts with, uh, in addition to the VMs uh, running on them uh, for, uh, for customers as well as part of OMS. That's a native solution out of the box. That, uh, that we announced at, at Ignite. And um, you know, we're just going to continue to do more and more. I think you've all seen the rapid innovation that we've introduced. And in automation and control, I mentioned this was a hot topic, the fact that we can now uh, manage and report on updates for Windows and Linux servers in customer environments with, uh, with OMS. Uh, boy, did customers want to know more here. So we can uh, help to um, not only uh, notify when, uh, when updates are, are available and required, but also sequence the, uh, the application of those updates with, uh, with the OMS suite. So 
Huge value for customers there. Folks loved what they saw in the main sessions, and they were mobbing us in the booth to, uh, to learn more, as they were with change monitoring. Uh, they loved what they saw with our ability to difference the, uh, the, the configuration across servers, point out when configurations have changed, and, uh, and alert them in, in a very intelligent fashion uh, to the fact that um, they, they may want to dive further into, uh, into what they're seeing change in their environment. So huge new capabilities announced in update management and change monitoring with OMS. Uh, great thing for you to learn more about and talk to your customers. Because if they were anything like the folks that I saw at Ignite, they're going to be really interested in that. As they are in some of the security enhancements, like uh, the common event uh, format support, um, Cisco ASA devices are, are just one example of many uh, devices that use uh, set format. And now we can incorporate and import uh, on an ongoing basis those logs from uh, customer security uh, devices and provide the heuristics and the monitoring and the trending and the alerting that they've come to expect from OMS, all done in a very intelligent fashion. And the great thing that, uh, that we do with security and that we're enhancing and that extends to these uh, uh, Ceph uh, compatible devices is the behavioral um, detections. The fact that we can look for patterns from external threats and internal threats and notify the customer if, uh, if there are, are indications of, um, of malfeasance. Uh, within their organization as well as without. So great capabilities there, stuff that, uh, that folks absolutely loved at Ignite. Now we've only highlighted one of the many things that were uh, introduced and announced in the protection and recovery space here on this slide, and that's the fact that System Center DPM and very soon um, Azure Backup Server uh, now natively support VMware environments. So through vCenter, through ESX hosts, we can orchestrate VM level backups of uh, VMware based virtual machines and uh, back them up not only locally to a local uh, backup storage pool, but also vault those uh, backups to Azure offsite. So some great native VMware backup capabilities that have been added into uh, Azure backup portfolio. But that's not all. Uh, we also announced some really cool architectural changes to uh, DPM uh, in System Center 2016 that make it much easier to manage storage. So for anyone who has set up DPM for their customers in the past or for your own organization, you have, uh, uh, I'm sure, cursed the way storage is managed with uh, dynamic disks and dedicated uh, partitions and just how uh, frustrating it can be to manage a DPM environment at scale due to the storage model. Well, that's all gone. We've gone to a much more flexible storage pool model built on top of resilient file system, uh, enhancing the deduplication capabilities and the cloning capabilities, making it much easier to roll out DPM in a, in a scalable and easy to manage manner. So I think you'll be really happy with what you see there, the changes that have been made. Now we also introduced some new monitoring and alerting capabilities for IaaS VM backups. Uh, we now have support for backup of encrypted VMs, uh, VMs that are using server-side encryption within Azure. And um, we are enhancing the, uh, the, the integration of Azure Backup into uh, the Azure portal workflows to make it easier to enable Azure Backup for your customers. So two examples of what we're doing there is we are adding uh, the capability during uh, VM provisioning to select uh, adding the backup agent and configuring um, backup as that VM is created. So what a great thing that is there. Right? You're deploying a VM from uh, the gallery. You can add backup right out of the gate. And now you as a customer know that as soon as that VM is being used for a production workload, it is protected. So that's a great enhancement. 
And we are planning on doing the same thing for migration as well. So as customers use site recovery to migrate their machines to Azure as part of that new complete migration workflow that we added, there will be an option to add Azure Backup and begin scheduled backups of that now migrated from on-premise to Azure VM. Again, making it really easy to protect production workloads that are now running on VMs in Azure that used to run in-house. So really cool integration, really cool ease of use enhancements that the Azure Backup folks are, are doing for us and for our customers. And I think it's um, really a, a great thing that, uh, that they're doing there. Carl, if you don't mind if I stop you, we've got a few questions. Uh, Perfect segue. I was gonna I was gonna <laughs> offer that up, Parker. Perfect timing. Perfect. So um, first off, we have someone ask if there is an estimated time arrival for uh, the VMware backup for MABS, M-A-B-S. That is a great question. So what that uh, what that individual is referring to is the fact that we went GA with the backup of VMware VMs uh, leveraging System Center Data Protection Manager uh, last month. We have not yet introduced it in Azure Backup Server, and that is coming. The uh, backup team will deliver that by the end of this calendar year in the next Azure Backup Server um, uh, update. So you will see that very, very soon. They're working hard on that. And then the other question we have uh, was referring to uh, a few slides back, but it was um, uh, just about the Microsoft anti-malware product. And um, this person was looking for, for an antivirus product for SQL Server 2016, but they just saw that there weren't too many options. So they were wondering if that is free and a part of OMS or if that's something that they need to look for separately. Yeah, great question. So not part of, uh, of OMS. That, that is a, a different... Uh, a different different solution, different solution area, but um, let's uh, let's make note of that, Parker, and we can we can go to uh, to the the SQL team and get uh, get some better guidance there. Perfect, and that's all the questions we have, so you can keep moving forward. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to try to march through a few more things here before I switch over. Last time we had a bad experience when uh, when I tried to switch over and screen share and do a demo. I'm hoping this time's going to go better. But uh, let's power through, do a few more things, and then we'll, we'll switch over. All right, so Azure Backup for VMs, nothing new. We've been doing that for a while now. Uh, we now have support for the encrypted VMs. Uh, we announced a few other things at Ignite that, um, that I'm going to mention here in just a second. Uh, but that offering is getting really exciting. And I don't think it's a surprise to anyone here on the call that we have also announced uh, site recovery of, between Azure regions. And we will be seeing a public preview of that functionality very soon. Uh, right now, the site recovery team is working on delivering that by the end of this calendar year. And we're going to dive into that a little further, but these are things we, again, make you trusted advisors to your customers, pointing out the fact that running VMs in a public cloud does not mean that they're exempt from backup or disaster recovery. They still need to provide these services for production machines. And we give them the ability to do that. We are the only public cloud that provides a native service for backup and very soon the only public cloud that will provide a native disaster recovery solution across regions. And for folks who think Geographically redundant storage is the answer. It is that DR solution. It is that backup solution for uh, VMs between different regions. It, it, is, it is not. Um, geographically redundant storage is not intended to be used that way. So this is the solution that gives a customer the same level of availability and maybe even superior to what they have on premise. So this solution from a backup perspective gets better and better. We've had the capability to restore VMs for a while, uh, the same with restoring disks. What we announced at Ignite and what is in preview right now is the capability to do item level restores with IaaS VM backup. That is really exciting. The fact that I can drill down and restore individual files or individual folders or go down into an application and restore application-specific elements 
instead of restoring the entire VM uh, is huge. That is something that customers reasonably expect from any backup solution. Now we are adding that as a cloud native VM backup first. Again, the first provider to do that. So not only are we enhancing that public cloud first backup solution, but we're enhancing it to provide the types of capabilities that customers expect from an enterprise backup product. So really exciting announcement there at Ignite. And again, this is public preview within Azure uh, Backup today. So you can begin uh, using this and showing your customers. We also announced at Ignite that we will be delivering within the Azure Backup uh, portfolio the capability to backup Azure SQL databases. So yes, you can do this natively within the Azure SQL management interface today, but you're limited in terms of how many database backups you can retain. And uh, it, it, not the sophisticated or, or um, uh, backup manager centric solution that customers expect. Now what we're doing is we're enabling that backup administrator, the person in the company who's responsible for all backup and recovery efforts to manage Azure SQL backups as well, all through the common Azure backup interface. So we haven't released this yet, but this is a coming soon feature that we announced at Ignite, and I believe during the session they demoed it as well. So great uh, session to review from, uh, from Ignite uh, and something that will be really exciting to those boring backup guys who, uh, who I used to be um, years ago inside of a customer. I know I'd be excited about that, and, and that's kind of sad. Carl, we actually had some questions pop in there too, if you don't mind me stopping you for a second. Sure, no problem. Um, one person asked if you have any, a URL about upcoming Azure to Azure Site Recovery. Um, if you have any URLs about information there, they have some customers who are interested in that. Great question. So the best source of information there is the Ignite session on uh, Site Recovery. So if you go to ignite.microsoft.com, go to Sessions at the top and search for session number, bear with me one second, I gotta look through the eye chart here. Uh, doo -doo -doo, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, if you search for session, I know it's shown in a few of them, but BRK2198, uh, you'd be able to watch the uh, the video demo of um, of this capability. Uh, if there are no slides, so I downloaded the slides, and because this is a pre-release feature, we did not uh, publish any. But um, we did uh, we did show it. We did actually deliver a live demo at Ignite. So go uh, go check out those uh, those sessions on um, on site recovery and you will be able to uh, show your customers it live and working. Perfect, just two more questions. Uh, one person asked, does that mean we can now back up VMs in a region that doesn't support backup vaults to a region that does have backup vaults? For example, an internet as a service, Azure virtual machine in Canada central region backed up to a vault in East US region. Ah, that is a great question. So devil is in the details. Uh, the answer is no, the short answer. Uh, the way Azure Backup continues to work today is uh, the backup, as I've depicted here, has to be within the same region as the VM itself. So for our, uh, our friends in Canada, uh, Azure Backup, as was pointed out there, is not yet available. We are working hard to deliver that soon in the Canadian data centers. But even when it is delivered, it will still mean a VM living in Canada East, for example, has to be backed up to Canada East. Uh, redundancy outside of that regional data center uh, will be available through site recovery. Uh, and uh, going forward, you know, we, we do have the goal to um, deliver backup uh, outside that, uh, that same region as well. Gotcha. And then actually a quick follow-up question. Someone asked, so site recovery is only if both regions are up? 
Uh, no, that is that is not the case. So site recovery is intended to protect uh, from that primary region going offline. So the example that I have here on this slide, uh, the site recovery service would be running in West US or any data center of the customer's choosing. We are not mandating the pairing of Azure regions. This could be East and Central. It could be uh, Canada and Netherlands. It could be anything that um, that's available to that customer in their subscription. Uh, but the site recovery service will be running, in my example, in West. If East were to fail, I can bring up all of those resources in West. So it is not dependent on both uh, sites being uh, being up and running in order to uh, to function and provide that failover capability. Perfect. And then the last question we have at the moment is: Do item level restores work with Windows Server 2016 storage spaces in Storage Spaces Direct, or data is spread across several disks? Oh, that is a great question. So I don't believe Storage Spaces Direct apply uh, within Azure. Um, just due to the, the hardware accessibility and uh, but uh, storage spaces, I, I don't believe there are any special restrictions or limitations around storage spaces. Great question. If you can make a note, Parker, I will follow up to make sure that that is the case with engineering. But I don't believe there are any special considerations there. Perfect. And that's all we have for now. Outstanding. All right, one other quick note here on uh, Azure to Azure site recovery. Uh, that demo was killer. Wait until you see it. Um, I, I may have gotten that session number wrong, but the uh, the slide earlier that shows all of the uh, uh, the sessions and the session codes, you'll, you'll be able to find it. Just skip through the video, and it's toward the end. You'll, you'll be able to see it. And what you will see us do is not only provide protection uh, for the VMs and automate recovery of the VMs, but as my really fuzzy screenshot shows here, uh, we can also assess and provide a recovery environment for uh, the networking within that Azure VM production environment as well. So the ASR engineering team really went above and beyond. This is more than just VM level recovery. This is VM and network and all sorts of sophisticated uh, configuration parameters that you need to make sure you can get a production IaaS-based application up and running in another region very, very quickly. And just like site recovery from an on-premise environment to Azure, all of the functionality like test failovers uh, still exist, meaning not only can I make sure that my plan will work before terrible things happen, but I could also use another Azure region and a separate compute network and storage environment to perform uh, regular dev test or patch testing or OS update testing uh, type of activities. Because those test failover copies that I create are uh, non-disruptive to the flow of data within ASR, and they're easily disposable when, uh, when I'm done, uh, it allows me to use that test failover functionality in very creative ways for testing, above and beyond a DR test plan. So really, really exciting stuff. You get all of the capabilities of on-premise to Azure and more. Okay, so we're doing good here on time. I've got a few quick things to uh, fly through, and then I should, uh, I should be able to switch over and do demos here. Um, so, just the, you know, in, in talk show style, as though Parker, you were, uh, you know, you were Conan O'Brien. Uh, yes, I do indeed have something else to plug outside of uh, of, of what the, we've been talking about here so far. So, I have been asked to uh, spend time this year focusing on Azure Storage, uh, which I'm excited about. I can't remember last time if I mentioned this or not, but I have a long uh, career, a long history, a lot of certifications in uh, storage infrastructure. I've dealt with EMC, NetApp, HP, IBM uh, storage in, in my career uh, from both a, a Windows, a Linux, and a Unix perspective, SAN and NAS. So I'm excited about this. And it gives me the capability to offer you even more resources and more training and more um, 
campaigns and more opportunities to go to your customers and provide value and, and deliver some, uh, some great services and, and some great opportunities. So uh, I have a series that I started last month uh, where we are profiling storage solutions that leverage Azure. Uh, the next one is on the 28th uh, here at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern. I included a, a link uh, down there at the bottom, and I will uh, make sure that an ICS is, uh, is available on the Yammer page. Uh, I'm going to be working with the product team and delivering a series of roadshows around the country, around North America. And um, I'll make sure that that gets posted to Yammer as well. I'd love to see you all there. And uh, we're going to work on business development, and we're going to work on technical enablement in, uh, in those roadshows. And we'll uh, further enhance that technical enablement through on-demand training that, uh, that I'm going to be putting together with the product team. And I'm going to be hosting office hours for our partners. So storage may be new to many of you in your practices. And even if it's not, cloud storage is, is a little bit different than, uh, than standard on-premise uh, SAN and NAS. And I'm going to open up office hours for both business and technical related questions to help you all move forward and build uh, practices in the cloud storage space. And what are those practices that you can build? Well, not only do we have our native solutions like Store Simple, which is what will be profiled on that call uh, on the 28th, and Store Simple has some really exciting announcements coming up about enhanced functionality for the arrays. Uh, in hand, added use cases, and a really cool thing that the engineering team is doing to make data that StoreSimple has transferred to Azure accessible to other Azure services. So tune in on the 28th to learn more about what the StoreSimple team is doing. But outside of that, we work with these partners and vendors as well in three key areas. Backup and disaster recovery. Many of the folks you saw on that last slide provide Azure integrated solutions. Hybrid storage and global data access. Hybrid storage is uh, what Store Simple provides, right? And so do vendors on that prior slide. Extending on premise storage to the cloud, tiering, and also backup of the content on those uh, on premise appliances. Global data access is file sharing across multiple sites, across multiple users. So there are several solutions in that space, and I'm going to go ahead and highlight those in a second. But what this allows for, and where we see this used often, is in software development and engineering organizations where the same folks distributed across the globe need to work on the same set of files. And these global access solutions allow customers to do that while retaining uh, locks. So if I'm an engineer here in the US, I've opened up a CAD drawing, I'm doing work on it actively, I retain that lock as long as I'm doing work. But when I save and close that drawing, I go home and my peer in Asia wants to do some work on it as well or review what I've done, they can open that document and they're working off the same copy. So that's global data access solutions. And we're going to uh, work with our partners there in that space and give you guys some uh, really cool, exciting things you can talk about with, uh, with your customers. And then the third uh, use case that we're really going to focus on is long-term archives. And this is a great, great use case for cloud storage. Instead of devoting racks of equipment, tons of power and cooling to long term document storage or application archival, I'm able to use the cloud, not consume all that space, and just let it sit there in an Azure data center where it's still accessible if you need it, but um, much less expensive. So here are some of those uh, backup and disaster recovery partners that we work with. Those are active links that take you directly to their solutions. And we're going to be working with closely with them to make it really easy for you all to interact and engage with these partners where you've got a good opportunity in backup and DR. The same for hybrid storage. We have our Store Simple solution, which is an outstanding product, an outstanding platform. platform. These partners of ours provide great platforms as well. Misuni, Panzura, and Talon, for example, provide a global access solution like we were talking about earlier, where I have users around the globe who need to work on the same copy of the same data and make sure that the updates are done in a consistent fashion. 
that's where they really shine. And we're going to work with them. We're going to profile their solutions over the coming months and make it easy for you to do business with them and easy to help your customers expand their use of Azure Storage. And then finally, the same with uh, Content Archive. Uh, some great vendors that we work with today. We had an internal win with, uh, with OpenText uh, just earlier this month, a great story around SAP Archive to Azure. And uh, we have the same stories and the same great integration with NTP, Commvault, HubStore, EMC, and, and others uh, across the board. So great opportunities to help your customers with a big problem that they have around data growth. And to make it even easier for you, on November 1st, we are launching a promotion with Azure Cool Storage that makes it ridiculously inexpensive to store backup and archival data inside of Azure. Just crazy, crazy pricing. I, I feel like one of those guys on the used car commercials that, uh, you know, it is a fire sale. We must be crazy with these prices uh, kind of thing because you, you look at the the discounts that we're offering as part of this promotion, uh, and, and they're enormous, and it's ridiculously cheap to store data inside of Azure when leveraging this promotion. Now, this is uh, limited availability. Uh, reason being, we will be releasing a new archival storage platform as well. Uh, so this is uh, effectively a stopgap measure until that, um, that archival storage is released, but um, just a great bargain for, uh, for customers. Uh, it does require a pre-commitment uh, to purchase in the quantities that you see there. So minimum quantity being 10 terabytes, that nets a 0.7 cents per gigabyte price, so less than a penny per gigabyte, all the way up to your massive enterprise customers who have huge archives that they want to uh, get off-premise. Uh, five petabyte pre-purchase nets a 0.7 four cents per gigabyte cost for storage in Azure. Now the prices that you see there are much less expensive than what uh, they will find from our competitors in the cloud storage space and we've got some examples of pricing here. Not only less expensive but better access and service SLAs as well. Uh, guaranteed consistency and retrieval that, uh, that happens in seconds as opposed to uh, hours. So really, really exciting offering here. Uh, this should allow you to capture a whole bunch of that backup and, uh, and archive space. And yes, it is even less expensive than on-premise storage. That's something I hear all the time is, oh, we don't have a data center floor space problem. Okay, well, you're lying. But even if that were true, um, this is the type of cost that you just can't get from a traditional on-premise array vendor. These are really, really uh, awesome offers that allow you to catapult those uh, backup and archive solutions and hybrid storage solutions that we uh, have been talking about here for the last few slides uh, with, uh, with some pretty serious momentum. Now, the uh, final uh, need to knows there on these, uh, we released on November 1st in the pricing tool, as I mentioned. You'll see four different SKUs for those four different capacity uh, tiers. If you are working an active opportunity right now, you absolutely have to have this pricing before November 1st. Con contact your licensing specialist, and uh, they can help get access to these SKUs beforehand. But general availability of these SKUs in the pricing tool on November 1st. Uh, the uh, terms of the pricing will be coterminous with the customer's uh, enterprise agreement, and um, they, the, the storage does not carry over from, uh, from year to year. So it is uh, 10 terabytes uh, for a year, for example, at this price. Uh, if I only use 8 out of the 10, um, I don't have 2 terabytes in the bank that would allow me to go up to 12 terabytes uh, at that same price in, in year two. Um, it is a user-lose uh, kind, of, um, kind of model there. Uh, available in uh, U.S. data centers, not yet available in Azure Gov. Uh, I do not believe cool storage is available in our Canadian data centers yet either, but um, that is, information is publicly available on the Azure website. And uh, great, great use cases for um, Amazon Glacier competes. Uh, backup, archive, and tiered storage, like we highlighted earlier, 
with uh, our native uh, solutions, Microsoft native solutions, or third-party solutions like um, those we highlighted, with one exception. There's uh, something behind that asterisk there, right? Azure Backup does not yet support cool storage. That is something that is on the roadmap. That is something the engineering team is working hard to deliver. But today, uh, customers cannot take advantage of cool storage with Azure Backup. They can with Commvault, uh, Symantec, um, EMC, NetApp, uh, HP, Enterprise, all of their backup uh, solutions supported. Uh, in addition to uh, Veeam and, and others. Um, they can make use of, of cool storage. Azure Backup cannot yet. So, uh, doo -doo -doo, boy, I'm running close on time here once again. Man, I just uh, I get on a roll. Um, so, uh, one request from all of you before we, we go through the questions that I'm sure have, uh, have popped up, Parker. Uh, my question for all of you is, what would you like to know more about? And of course, my areas of, of concern and interest are the OMS uh, suite and uh, Azure Storage and use cases for Azure Storage. So uh, not that I will ignore anything else that comes in, but um, if you could all do us a favor and uh, log what you would like to learn more about in the chat, uh, we can go ahead and uh, and get folks, whether it's myself or or others in the organization, to come back in future sessions and uh, and talk about those. Uh, so we'll go ahead and capture all of that and make sure we put together some great tailored sessions for you. With that being said, Parker, how do our questions look? Yeah, we just got two at the moment. Uh, one just came in on one of your last slides, and it was talking about the promo that you mentioned. Is that only for EA Azure customers? It is, yes. So great question. It is only for EA customers, and uh, it does require that pre-purchase, that upfront commit uh, in, in either the 10 terabyte, 200, uh, 1 petabyte, or 5 petabyte increments. Great question. We got a few more. Uh, one person asked, with geographically distributed storage within an application that spans multiple countries, how do we audit the country laws? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so we have a document, um, well, not just a document. I think it's a, a, a table on the Azure Trust Center. And um, folks, if you haven't been to the Azure Trust Center lately, I would highly recommend it. We just overhauled it, made it easier to navigate and find information. And one of the things that, uh, that we do outline is uh, the adherence of our data centers to different um, industry and, and country uh, regulations. And um, a great example that, you know, that I'll provide is uh, in countries where data sovereignty is um, uh, understandably a, a big deal, um, GRS storage will not uh, violate those those data sovereignty uh, rulings. So uh, within Australia, within Germany, uh, within the uh, the UK data centers, um, we won't go outside those geographic boundaries with GRS. So if I wanted to protect VMs, for example. Uh, in uh, Germany and make sure that my redundancy boundary uh, went outside of Germany, uh, yes, I could use site recovery for that. I could, could replicate between different data centers. Uh, GRS storage, which is not the best example here because it's not a DR technology, um, but GRS storage will stay within those, those country boundaries. Great, uh, great question. You can learn more, get some documentation to share with your customers out on the Azure Trust Center. Perfect. Uh, actually, pertaining to the question I asked before about uh, EA, um, someone wanted to clarify, so that is not for CSP customers. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe that is correct. The Azure Pool storage promo pricing is not uh, available to CSP, I believe. But um, Parker, if you can make a note of that, I will verify that as well with, um, with the business group. But I am pretty confident it is not. Perfect. Uh, and then we got another one kind of along the same lines. Uh, someone wanted to get your opinion on Azure via an EA versus CSP. What do you think is better for a partner? 
Oh boy! Wow, that's a good question. Um, and, and if I can ask for clarification, if if that uh, uh, person can can follow up if for um, your your customers or your own use as a, as a partner. I just want to make sure that I, I'm clear on that. I'm guessing it's for customers. I'll let that person reply, and when they're doing that, I'll just ask another one. Uh, someone wanted. Uh, wait, they might have just beat me to it. <laughs> um, actually, no. So they're coming in like wildfire. I'm deploying my customers on an EA versus CSP. That's ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, so the answer there is, um, I, I think CSP is always the right answer. Um, you know, re reason being, if you are a CSP, if you are able to provision subscriptions. Um, you should do that. You know, it, it gives you that tighter relationship with uh, with your customer, that kind of ownership of the end-to-end -end experience, and the deliver the ability to uh, provide managed services in an easier fashion. If if that's something you're interested in doing, um, I, I think. I mean, my, my opinion, 99% of the time, CSP is the right answer when that's available to you. Uh, this person then replied, but you can't do everything in CSP versus an EA. The EA is mine, not my customers. Right. Uh, so some of the services are not yet available in CSP. That is correct. Uh, if you look at the reseller terms for, for Azure, though, uh, we, we are pretty specific about not being able to use your own EA uh, to provision customer resources. That that has to be done through CSP or an EA that they own. So reuse rights of Azure, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident, prohibit you from, from reselling services under your own EA uh, and offering those direct to customers. So I, I think my prior answer uh, applies there, and if it's something that's not yet available under CSP, then it, it has to be delivered through uh, to the customer through their own EA, not through a partner's. Gotcha. Just a few more questions. Don't want to go too over on time. Uh, sure, not worries. But, uh, someone wanted you to, if you can show the second cool storage promo slide again. Oh, um, sure. They believe that one is showing the different SKU offerings, just so they can get a visual of that. Uh, these slides will be posted as well, just... Um, that will. That's good to know as well that we will be posting the slides. Um, someone earlier, I just don't want to forget their question, uh, pointed out that they are very interested in what assessment tools are available to partners that would support resources running on premises in a VMware environment, being able to determine if the VMs and apps are cloud ready and what is needed to get them into Azure. Uh, they're just not sure if the Microsoft VM readiness assessment tool support this. So, what migration tools are recommended? Yeah, great question. So um, the uh, the MAP uh, toolkit will do that. There's an Azure assessment portion of uh, MAP. Um, that's one way to do it. Uh, we have a tool coming from the site recovery team, which uh, which will do that as well. It's it's really meant to uh, determine if um, uh, if the machines uh, can be protected by site recovery. But the great thing is. Uh, it will also tell you if site recovery could provide migration, if that machine has anything that is not supported uh, within Azure infrastructure services. So those two tools, one available today, one coming soon, um, both are, are free. And uh, also application dependency monitoring that we uh, talked about very briefly here today uh, not only allows you to you know, kind of take a look at those machines and assess uh, readiness, uh, but also outline how they're interconnected. So if a particular application has 10 servers that are uh, involved that play a part in delivering that application, uh, ADM will show all 10 servers. So you know if you want to migrate an app for that customer, you're capturing everything they need. That's a really exciting uh, feature of, of ADM. 
Awesome. Um, and before I ask our last question, we've had a, a few posts of people responding to some of the CSP versus EA um, questions that have been going on. So what I would recommend is that um, if you guys continue to have questions about these, please post those in the uh, Azure Partners Yammer group just so everyone can see those. Um, unfortunately, the messages that are coming in here are only coming to me and other the other moderators. So that's a conversation that I would highly encourage we continue on the Yammer page as well. Um, actually, quick clarifying question, is the cool storage promo info public or is as of now, is that only for partners? Uh, so it is not public yet. When it uh, when it goes pricing or when it goes in the pricing tool November first, it uh, it will be public. Um, again, if you if you have a hot opportunity where you think this uh, you know this this could really help you win that deal, close that deal before November first, um, you can get this pricing from uh, from your LSS and uh, and go ahead and and you know, march forward with it, but. You know, we, we are not uh, going to encourage uh, active conversation around this until until November 1st when it does go public. Awesome. And then the last question, just to respect everyone's time, uh, this person asked to know more about highly available file servers on Azure since there's no SLA for single virtual machines and they can't do failover clustering without shared storage. Um, and then they asked the question, maybe storage spaces, storage spaces scale out of the file server. Um, if you have any clarifying information on that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that the last one would help with the availability because you're you're still you know really limited to that single VM, even if you know, let's say the storage was mirrored across different accounts in, in different regions. Um, it's a great question. It is one that we get frequently. Uh, Azure files may be a solution if it meets the needs of that file sharing within Azure. Um, outside of that, it may be worth taking a look at uh, some of the vendors that um, that I profiled here, who offer appliances within Azure. Uh, SoftNAS is a is a great example, um, and I haven't uh, because I'm new to to this role. I haven't had an opportunity to really look at their uh, availability you know solutions as as well, but. Um, they may have uh, replication solutions between appliances that can uh, can address that, uh, and I totally understand the need for it. So um, I will do some research on that and post to the Yammer group. And uh, I'll also encourage one of my peers who specializes on CSP to uh, to engage in that conversation on the Yammer group as as well. We've uh, we've got some great expertise in that realm. Awesome. Thank you for that, Carl. Um, just to respect everyone's time, uh, any other questions that you guys have, I would highly, again, encourage you to post those in the Yammer group and continue those conversations there. And uh, Carl and others will obviously be sure to be um, involved in those conversations as well. Um, and with that, I would just like to remind everyone again that this recording will be posted on YouTube in the next few days in addition to the slides on the Yammer group. So you will have access to these as well. Um, but Carl, I just wanted to thank you again for your time. Uh, sorry we didn't get to any of the demos that you wanted to do. I guess we just had some questions that um, people were really thinking about. So um, I'm happy that we got to those questions and got to answer all those questions. Um, and I'm sure we will get your, your demos online in a way that people can view as well. Um, so with that, everyone, I would just like to thank you for your time. Um, and I just enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend that you have coming up. Um, and yeah, thank you guys. Have a great day.